is Olivia Mattis, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program. I'm president of the Sousa Mendez Foundation, and we have been running the Sunday programs since the beginning of the COVID period on beautiful stories of rescue, resistance, and hope. And our thought was to give a little bit of hope to people in these times when they need connection and they just need something beautiful to focus on. So each week we've been bringing you a, a different story. And today, today's program is about a story that I personally had never heard about until I stumbled upon it and contacted one of today's speakers and we put together the program. And this topic is about Jewish refugees who found a safe haven in <clears throat> Iowa during World War II. <clears throat> and most people don't know that there were Jewish refugees in Iowa during World War II in an operation that was uh, uh, run by the Quaker community who were very active in rescue <clears throat> throughout World War II. So we have today three wonderful speakers we have the world's expert on this subject, Dr. Michael Luik Thrams, and you will meet him in just a few minutes. We also have Donald Davis, who is the archivist of the American Friends Service Committee, which is uh, the social service agency that is part of the Quaker community. And we have Edith Lichtenstein, Frolig Morgan, it's a long name. Her maiden name is Lichtenstein, which is how she was known in the period in question. And she personally was one of these refugees who lived in Iowa during the war. So I'm going to start by turning the program over to Don Davis. He's going to give you a background uh, on uh, rescue efforts in general of the Quakers. Uh, and then after Don, we will turn the program over to Michael. And then after Michael, you will meet Edith. There's one more thing that I would like to add about the Quaker story. And that is the connection to the hero that our foundation honors, Aristides de Souza Mendes. Now, Souza Mendes was, was the Portuguese consul general in Bordeaux, France in 1940. And he issued visas to Portugal to any refugees who needed one. And he did this counter to the orders of his own government that didn't want refugees. So what happened was after Sousa Mendes completed his rescue action, he was summoned back to Portugal, put on trial and harshly punished by the Portuguese government. He was found guilty of the charges against him. He was fired. He was blacklisted, and his life and that of his family was ruined. So in 1943, he was in desperate circumstances, and he too considered himself a refugee in his own country, and he needed to escape. So it was at that point that Sousa Mendes wrote to the Quakers, asking for asylum for his own family. That was a petition that ultimately was not successful because the Quakers didn't understand why this Portuguese family in Portugal were themselves also refugees. But now I would like to take it back to today's program and introduce our first speaker, Don Davis. Don, how are you today? Very good, thank you, Olivia. And I wanted to thank the Sousa Mendes Foundation for allowing me to be part of this, inviting me to be part of this whole presentation. The American Friends Service Committee is a Quaker faith-based organization devoted to service, development, and peace programs throughout the world. Established in 1917, the AFC currently works with communities and partners worldwide to challenge unjust systems and promote lasting peace. In 1917, at the start of the U.S. entry into World War I, the founders of the American Friends Service Committee had a twofold objective. First was to provide meaningful service for young pacifists who are conscientious objectors. Conscientious objectors being persons who are opposed to military service due to religious or moral grounds. 
The second objective was to offer relief and assistance to civilian casualties of World War I. In the fall of 1917, they sent approximately 100 young men, both Quakers and non-Quakers, to France to assist in reconstruction efforts. These men built temporary housing, delivered food, clothing, building, medical supplies, drove ambulances, worked in hospitals, whatever was needed to help the civilian population of France. After the war, requests from the chairman of the American Relief Administration, Herbert Hoover, led the AFSC to taking charge of a massive feeding program to benefit starving children in Germany. The Treaty of Versailles, having not been ratified by the US Congress, prevented Hoover from delivering the aid through the ARA. The Quakers accepted the request, and by the middle of 1920, they were feeding over half a million children on a daily basis throughout Germany. Growing out of this relief work came a desire on the part of the Quakers to do something more that spoke to the root causes of conflict and war and to help facilitate understanding between groups of people. They began by creating Quaker International Centers. The centers were developed jointly between the British and American Quakers and established in Berlin, Paris, Vienna, Geneva, Warsaw, and Moscow. The primary objective of these centers was to provide a place where people could talk out their differences and find a peaceful alternative to their disputes. It was these centers that would become crucial in the effort to save European Jews before, during, and after World War II. As early as 1931, the AFC archives has records of individuals coming to the Quaker Center in Berlin requesting assistance in getting out of Germany. These requests were of enough importance and urgency that the AFC headquarters in Philadelphia began to send special funds to Berlin Center to assist individuals in their effort to leave. Throughout the 1930s, as the threat of the Nazis grew, so did the number of Quaker centers, with new offices opening up to Stockholm, Copenhagen, and Amsterdam, and Shanghai. For the American Friends Service Committee, the major relief work of World War II unofficially began in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War, when the AFSC once again engaged in a massive feeding program for Spanish refugee children. When the Spanish Civil War came to an end in 39, nearly half a million refugees were forced to flee Spain over the Pyrenean Mountains to France, where, the ref where refugee camps had been hastily set up by a French government. While France opened its doors to, these in, to those in need, it was in no way equipped to deal with the overwhelming flood of refugees. The Quaker workers followed the mass of refugees in order to offer help where they could. At first, the need was only with the population of Spanish refugees, but as the Nazi threat advanced, vast numbers of refugees from other countries joined the ever-increasing population of displaced individuals in need of assistance. In response to this humanitarian crisis, the AFSC office established a refugee, a refugee division headquartered in the Philadelphia office in 1938. The division coordinated all the AFSC work with refugees here in the United States and abroad, before long, a sophisticated network of activity connected the Philadelphia and London home offices with all the Quaker centers throughout Europe. The refugee centers also helped numerous smaller sectarian and non-sectarian organizations get supplies and money to various groups throughout Europe. After 1940, new refugee assistance offices were established in Rome and Lisbon. Quaker representatives visited the French refugee camps frequently, bringing supplies, relief packages, and messages from friends and family. They also worked tirelessly to assist refugees in obtaining the necessary paperwork and visas required to travel out of the war zone. In 1942, when the Nazis pushed south, taking over France, the American members of the team were forced to evacuate, but not before they scrambled to handle off the work to French Quakers and other members of the team who were able to continue their work helping Jews and non-Jews in need of assistance. The AFSC became an integral member of the United States Committee for the Care of European Children, the U.S. Com. The U.S. Com's mission was to help European children, regardless of nationality or religion, though the majority of the more than 300 children brought to the U.S. by the U.S. Com were Jewish. Through the U.S. Com, the AFSC coordinated with other relief agencies, such as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, and German Jewish Children Aid. The AFC was directly responsible for the management of approximately 16 children's colonies in the south of France for the care of refugee children. AFC staff working in the camps would find the most distressed and needy of children for inclusion in the children's colonies. The colonies were special homes established to help the children who were viewed as suffering the most from their individual situation. 
Often the children chosen to go to the colonies were orphaned with no parents, family, or guardian who could see to their care. In the colonies, the children were provided ample food, clothing, education, and the opportunity to live without experiencing the day-to-day -day trauma of life in the internment camps as a refugee. There were other child welfare organizations which the AFC was not responsible for, but assisted in offering help. The OSE was one such organization which operated as many as 15 towns throughout France during the war. The children's home in Limoges, France, which is pictured here, received supplies and financial support from the AFSC. In the United States, a number of different programs were established to help refugees. In 1942, a money transfer service was instituted by the AFSC's Philadelphia headquarters. During its first year in operation, an average of $18,000 per month was being sent to refugees by friends and family in the United States. A program called the Cooperative College Workshop for Refugees was established in 1941. Set up on the campus of Havaver College, it provided training in language and other areas pertaining to college instruction in the U.S. Professional placement services were established for individuals for various professions, such as teachers, artists, doctors, musicians, and others received assist, who received assistance in finding employment. I'd like to mention that one of my predecessors, Dr. Walter Thales, who was, a ref, who was a Jewish refugee who was helped over by the AFSC, became archivist in 1942 for the organization. A central location index was established in 1944 between the AFSC and six other cooperating agencies. It served as a clearinghouse for requests in locating lost relatives and friends displaced by the Holocaust. When the service closed in 1949, the AFSC had succeeded in locating in the U.S. 54% of the cases it handled. The AFSC also established refugee hostels in the U.S. Sky Island in Nyack, New York in 1939, Quaker Hill in Richmond, Indiana in 1940, and similar hostels took in European Jews and helped acclimate them to life in the United States. Powell House in 1943 opened in New York City and served as an educational center for refugees and a place where they could meet and socialize. And this brings us to our topic for today, which is the Scattergood Hostel pictured here. Considering our presentation today, I took a look in the archives and the segment you see above on the top of the slide is a entry from a diary that was kept, by, it was kept in Scattergood by members of, uh, by the guests who were staying there. And each guest seemed to take uh, a week or so and they would make different entries about what went on and have a little paragraph of the activities of that day. And here is the entry for the day when Edith and her family arrived in the Scattergood Hostel. And it reads, at lunch, we greeted our newcomers, the Lichtensteins, with their two children. And you can see below there is Edith and her brother in the center there, Edith holding the cat. The diary continues, we hope that they will find their place here. And that's a very good question. Where is here? Many of you will think that Iowa might be a very unlikely place for a bunch of European refugees to arrive. But actually, there were good reasons why America's largest direct response to the Holocaust, while it took place, was indeed in the American heartland. I can tell you, I'm Michael Lewick Trams, that the first Quakers began to pour into the Iowa frontier about the same time that my people arrived. I don't come from Quaker stock. That was the 1830s, 1840s. And the Quakers right away became active in social causes. For example, in West Branch, near where the later hostel would be established, the Quakers were hiding and assisting African Americans escape on the so-called um, Underground Railroad. In fact, there are still houses there where we know there are secret trap doors into the basements and um, hiding places upstairs under the roofs. So the Quakers already in Iowa in the 1800s were active in women's equality, trying to get women to vote. They were active in Native American affairs uh, with presences on reservations or Indian settlements. So it was actually sort of natural that in the summer of 1938, in August, a group of so-called young friends met in Clear Lake, Iowa, where I'm from, by coincidence. And they met at the Methodist camp, where, as another coincidence, my mother and I attended summer camps ourselves in the 40s and myself in the 70s. And they... Among the waters and the cool breezes underneath the big oak trees, 
talked about the events in Europe, and the young Quakers said, this Hitler fellow, he doesn't intend the Jews or the liberals or the socialists any good. We should do something. And they actually penned a letter to uh, the American Friends Service Committee already in the fall of 1938. And they said, we have this old school, Scattergood School, which had been in operation from 1890 until the Great Depression, so 1931 when it closed because of declining Quaker demographics and lack of money. We have this school and we have the willingness, you could bring refugees out from New York and from Philadelphia and the East Coast out to the American heartland to learn English faster. Um, we'd be prepared to do summer courses with them to take on projects and to help them to adjust and to integrate. By coincidence, from September to October 1938, the secretary of the American Friends Service Committee, Clarence Pickett, was actually in Nazi Germany on a fact-finding delegation. And he would have visited many of the places that Don just talked about. For example, the Friends Center in Planckstrasse, not far from Friedrichstrasse Bahnhof, so the middle of pre-war Berlin. Um, the um, pickets were going through Europe looking for information, you know, what is supplied of the Jews and others in, in Great, Great Germany, Gross Deutschland, so the ever-expanding German Reich. And when, when, of course, Clarence Pickett and the other Quaker delegates returned to the United States, it wasn't much longer, November 1938, all of you will know, um, it occurred what in Germany is translated the Reichsprogrammnacht, the Imperial Night of Program. The, the old name, Kristallnacht, has actually fallen out of favor here because um, German historians find that word too pretty, too romantic, the idea of cascading shards of glass. They don't like that. So um, they don't use it very much anymore, and they call it the Reichsprogrammnacht. At any rate, at that point, the American Friends Service Committee and the Iowa Quakers were in accelerated communication, and the Philadelphia Quakers said, look, we don't want to just find a place for these dejected Europeans in the summer. Could you take them all year round? And the Quakers in Iowa, like many places across the country, had actually separated along theological lines, the 1870s onward. Part of that had to do with um, theological developments, but also the Civil War played a role, and there are all these in, uh, influences. At any rate, for the first time in something like 50 years, the two branches of Iowa Quakerdom cooperated. The so-called conservative friends, to which I became a member in the 19, early 80s, they were conserving the original Quaker form of worship, so silence, silent meeting. They owned the school, and they said, um, we will renovate the buildings, we'll get them livable again. And the so-called progressive friends, which now are called the Friends United Meeting, it's more of an evangelical sort of Methodist or Baptist style um, Quaker worship. They said, we will outfit the rooms, we'll find old school books, um, we'll find stray lambs and chicks and um, bushels of tomatoes and peaches to feed the people. And so the two branches of Quakerism came together as of January 1939, and already in April, the first load of refugees arrived from Philadelphia, uh, chaperoned by young John Kaltenbach. In um, the weeks thereafter, the first family came, the Deutsch family. The Deutsches came from Vienna. And they were the first family, but they wouldn't be the last family. There were something like 23 children at the hostel. Almost all but two um, became, of these children became social workers, teachers, um, politically active. We can talk about Edith in a moment. So these Quakers had a great impact right away. Um, the hostel, I should say, um, did... The Quakers did what they could to establish the hostel in its best possible premises. They reached out to the, the Jewish communities of Des Moines, to Rabbi Mannheimer, who was then a leading theological rabbi in the Midwest. And we have in the archives the letters to him saying, wouldn't you like to come to West Branch to give a, a series of lectures, the Jew, his past, his present, and his future? We, unfortunately, we don't know if Rabbi Mannheimer accepted or not because we don't have that correspondence. But what we um, do know is the Quakers also reached out to Jews of Cedar Rapids, and I think the Liechtensteins even went one uh, holiday, but Jews would be taken on weekends or holidays to Cedar Rapids or Iowa City to spend Hanukkah or to go to Shabbos. Um, the Quakers were not about the job of converting these people, of, of proselytizing, but rather to help them. And frankly, at that point, it meant to help them learn English 
and to Americanize. When I did my research at Humboldt Universität in the late 90s, it was very interesting because I compared 13 different refugee centers, <clears throat> the criteria being that they were all residential. Two of them were government sponsored, one by the United States government, one by the British government. The two that were government had advantages and disadvantages, strengths and weaknesses. And then there were a couple other Jewish sponsored programs, but eight of the 13 that I found were Quaker sponsored. And my criteria included that the people had to be staying overnight. It had to be a residential program. There were lots of day programs from Jewish social agencies, as well as other Quaker social service agencies or the Unitarians or Catholics. So there were relatively a lot of agencies helping refugees sew their torn clothes and put on new buttons or to look for a job or to find papers to emigrate. But there were relatively very few pro programs that were set up where the people could actually live. And the Quakers had the idea, well, if they come and live in Iowa or later Quaker Hill or other places, Scattergood was supposed to be a prototype for about 40 refugee centers across the country, that this mix of about two thirds refugees and one third um, they called them hosts, so the refugees weren't really called refugees, they were called guests. If they had um, about two-thirds guests and one-third host, that these um, refugees would pick up English much faster. Um, you will remember that in 1939, when the hostel began, English was not yet the world language, it was still French for diplomacy and science and uh, other affairs. So the Quakers were set on helping these people in English as fast as they could, um, I began writing my dissertation with the wrong premise that those, you know, well-intended but uh, nearsighted Quakers tried to take away the native culture of these, these mostly Jews, but not only Jews. And the people I was interviewed, like Edith and um, others, said, no, kid, you've got it wrong. We actually wanted to integrate. Soon there was war. And when we went into a shop with a heavy German accent, and, and in those days you had to order most groceries over the counter, and they would weigh the sugar and the flour and put it in a paper bag, it didn't bode well if you came with a heavy German accent. You had lots of problems. So the refugees, um, besides their English classes, they designed theater. They had their own theater performances. Uh, they went on field trips to see how the University of Iowa um, school worked. They went to opera. They went to the Amana colonies, of which you may have heard, which had been a German communal sect. By then already had disbanded, became a corporation that produced probably your air conditioners or your refrigerators. So they would go on these field trips, again, as a way to expose the refugees to American way of life. They went to a grocery store and went through ounces and pounds and cooking uh, marvels like measuring cups and things like that. Everything that they could think of. They gave the people driving lessons because those few refugees who had had a car in Europe, if you had a car, you mostly had money for a chauffeur. So most middle-class people didn't own a car and those who um, did have, uh, would have, wouldn't have learned to drive probably. Um, they also tried to get the people jobs and the first jobs tended to be in Peoria or Kansas City or Detroit. And they had a couple of job placement officers um, Par Danforth, and before that, Giles Zimmerman. And they scoured the Midwest from North Dakota to Kansas to Ohio and back. And they did indeed place people, at least initially, in the first placements. Uh, the Lichtensteins, as Edith will tell you, ended up in St. Paul. And I'll let her um, uh, tell the, the cue of that one. What strikes me as an otherwise really positive story needs to be relativized. There were rumors nearby that the refugees were spies. These were ever reoccurring rumors that would go around. And so we have reports of the Des Moines Register journalists coming to interview the people. And then in the middle of an English class out in the lawn in the, in the uh, warmer weather where the journalist was, was watching the teaching being done, uh, the school bus would go by and the windows would drop and the kids would yell, hey, you German spies. Uh. So where were the kids getting that? They weren't getting it on their own. They were getting it at home. We know that at one point the refugees and staff actually had an open house. They took the neighborhood women through all the nooks and crannies. And there was a um, Austrian socialite, Claire Hohenado Patek, and she would roll out the dough and she would show them how to make the strudel and this and that. And while the strudel was baking, they took them everywhere through the hostel, all under the stairs, the closets, the, nick, the nick, uh, crannies and nicks. And then they came back. And they had seen there was no uh, hand radios, there were no secret code books. And of course, those women went home and said, John, honey, those aren't German spies, those are strudel makers. So they had an offensive, 
They brought um, the FBI head from Chicago. His name was Diamond. I'm guessing maybe he was Jewish with a name like Diamond um, in Mason City. By footnote, we had Diamond's uh, department store when I was a kid, Jewish owned. At any rate, this Mr. Diamond brought his wife, which I don't quite understand why. They came to observe the hostel. And Diamond also wrote a report and said, we don't see any, any grounds for any suspicion. Well, then the actual war sucked us in as of December 1941. And so the refugees and the staff were all very worried. In, in the meantime, they had it gone to, for example, Grinnell College on annual um, seminars on international world affairs. Well, they couldn't. They were now forbidden. They had to surrender all re uh, radios that they had. They had to surrender other uh, dangerous things. So any, I don't know, short, shorthand keeping machines or anything they would have had in the office. Um, and they were not allowed to travel outside the county or go beyond Iowa City, which made job, job placement very difficult. One of the ways they got around that was the Grinnell College staff that previously had welcomed the people and hosted them at these international institutes. They came to the hostel and brought guest speakers to the refugees. Some rather famous people came. Uh, Grant Wood came and gave an art lecture. Uh, the Von Trapp singers of Yolehu, who, uh, Goat and Herd, they came and sang at the hostel. Um, there were numerous, quote, famous people came by. Some of the people who were uh, refugees at the hostel became or were already famous themselves. Um, for example, we have um, Paul Froelich, who had been a member of the Reichstag from uh, Leipzig, a, a Jew, at least culturally a Jew. Uh, Marie Juchatz, who was not Jewish, I think she was raised Catholic, but she had been one of the founders of the Arbeiter Wohlfahrt, which is the wor uh, German worker welfare organization. It was a quasi or uh, voluntary state organization. She had been at the hostel. Many of these older people, unfortunately, they didn't speak very good English. And people like Marie Juchatz returned to post-war Germany. She became active in politics again. In fact, there was a postage stamp issued in her honor, I think the 50s or the 60s. And there's today in Berlin, in the, Reich, in the Reichstag building, there's a hall called the Miyukarts Hall. And she's a big celebrity of the Arbeiter Wolfar world. So this, this um, hostile experiment took in butchers and ordinary uh, name, nameless people, but also intellectuals, artists. There was a communist couple um, who got a special permission from Congress to emigrate um, the Hausens. They were there. Most of the people, I would say about 85%, had either Jewish last names, I supposed, or we know, knew they were Jews, practicing or cultural. About 15% were non-Jews. Um, Viennese Catholic Socialist who came, they fled the Nazis, the Bowers, for example, the man and wife. And there were artists who came, intellectuals. So it's really a mixture, but predominantly Jews. And frankly, they were people that nobody else, quote, really wanted. One family told the story, um, they went to a Jewish social service center in Manhattan to a, a high rise, and they went down the whole hallway. And every other agency, they were told, you have too few children. The next one said, you have too many children. The next said, the parents are too old. The next one said, you have too little money, et cetera, et cetera. And the last Jewish agency, they turned to these Jewish refugees and said, well, we can't help you either, but go to the end of the hall, the Quakers can. So the Quakers put them on the Greyhound bus and sent them to Iowa. <laughs> we're, we're quite proud of this legacy. Um, it's a rare honor for us to, be, to have America's largest response to the Holocaust in our state. It didn't end so gloriously, though. As the war intensified, the Quakers were able to get fewer and fewer people out of Germany. Um, the SS Lewis, when it returned to Rotterdam or wh wherever it landed, uh, Robert Balderson, the director, director's husband, was there. She was in Iowa, Martha Balderson directing the hostel. Her husband was in, I think it was Rotterdam. And he wrote, it's the saddest day of my life to watch 1,100 dejected mostly Jews disembark for a future that we can all imagine meant basically getting on a train going to a death camp. So as the uh, number of refugees decreased, the Quakers said, well, we have this hostel, and for the first time, we're not running in a red, in the deficit. We actually have black numbers, not red numbers. We could bring Japanese-American internees. No. The locals, not the Quakers, but the local non-Quakers, they said, not in your life. There were angry protests at the local gym. There were Hollywood B-rate film scenes of screaming Midwest farmers, don't bring those Japs here. Our sons are over fighting those people. So finally, the Quakers said, all right. We will honor the local consensus, but they put a knife in, into the uh, letter and said, but you won't have 
labor to help harvest the, the, the crops, and um, this is regrettable. So they didn't bring Japanese Americans from the internment camps of the West, they sent them to Des Moines, but that's another story. So that's what I wanted to say about the story. Uh, it was a great honor of mine. Uh, when I was younger, not so gray haired, I actually uh, met 40 of these people and it was, it was a great honor. And I feel obligated as long as I'm alive to tell the story in whatever way I can. You can find Out of Hitler's Reach, my book about it. Um, you can find it in used bookstores or whatever, but almost all the contents are also online. I sent you a link. If you go to um, our Amazon page, you can get the book. And in fact, Edith is on the cover with her cat. Edith, do you have your cat there today? <laughs> it's my turn, huh? I yeah. Uh, I'm not going to give you all of the scientific history and all of that stuff. I'll give you a highly personal, our personal, our family's experience, and how we got to uh, Scattergood and then how we ended up uh, in uh, Minnesota after that. Uh, we came to America, well, we left Germany in 1933, two months after Hitler became chancellor and we barely got out with just a suitcase. Spent two months in Switzerland, couldn't stay there because uh, at that time, uh, people coming over the border, Switzerland was neutral, uh, did not uh, accept uh, refugees that had no money and no way to live. So they uh, directed us to, they said, go to the nearest policeman across the border in France, tell them you're a refugee and uh, they all take it from there. So that's what happened. We ended up, uh, I have to be brief about this part. Uh, we ended up in Paris. We lived in Paris and the outskirts of Paris. At some point or other, as uh, the uh, Germans were advancing, uh, the French collected up all of the mail uh, refugees, German refugees, enemy aliens. They left the families alone, but uh, my father ended up in a camp in Brittany and then uh, ended up, as the Germans advanced, ended up in a camp that uh, uh, Michael uh, alluded to there on the border in the Pyrenees, where all of the Spanish refugees were, and my father ended up at Gers, but that's another story. Uh, and so we were separated for a while. We were in Paris when the Germans uh, came as far as the outskirts of Paris on the north, and there was no transportation, no way for us to get out, so we joined thousands of people, and we walked from Paris to Limoges, and I'm not sure at what point the Quakers picked us up, but I know that they were active in Limoges, they were active in various of the other places we stopped. We ended up then going farther south, for a short time, there was a piece of France that was free called Free France there. And we ended up in Le Puy, and we knew he, we had to get out of there too, but we didn't know where my father was. We had lost track. Anyway, we got back together uh, and through a program of uh, Swiss foster parents, uh, my brother's Swiss foster parents, we used to go there every summer. I have pictures of that too, but that's another story. We managed, they gave us their life savings, so we were able to book passage on uh, the Mozinho, uh, uh, I think probably one of the last ships to come over to this country. Now this country had uh, rather restrictive quotas and the Jewish quota was failed by 1941. And so Roosevelt established a special quota called political refugees and we were able to get in on that. And I think we may have been one of the last boats we came in on a Portuguese reconverted freighter that they had captured from uh, the Germans in World War I. And after 14 days at sea, we got to New York. Uh, where we floated in the uh, harbor because it was Labor Day weekend, finally got on shore, spent uh, oh, less than two months in New York, didn't learn any English because uh, it, it was just loaded with refugees. And since we spoke both German and French, uh, we were able to manage nicely without learning uh, English. Uh, at that point is when the Quakers picked us up there, brought us to Iowa. I really don't have too much memory of exactly how we got there, but it was a completely different life experience from what we have ever experienced. Uh, we were all city people, by and large, you know, we'd gone from uh, Limburg to uh, Paris to Le Puy to, to uh, over here to New York. And so uh, the hinterland in America was a completely different 
uh, experience for us all. For my parents, it was probably more of a shock than for us kids because uh, we had learned French uh, very easily and we spoke it like natives, not our parents, but my brother and I. And then when we got here to America, once we left New York, we learned English, I think maybe within six months after we had started school it, uh, in uh, Scattergood. And it was my first experience going to school in a school bus. The uh, school was several miles away from Scattergood, out through the country, and being picked up by a school bus every morning was a completely new experience. Uh, the kids, since we were really sort of uh, uh, an exotic product there, everyone treated us decently, and once we learned English, we spoke it like natives very quickly. Uh, it was more difficult for my parents. Uh, and so here we were in this rural environment with uh, Sarah and Walter Stanley, who were, if you've seen the Grant Wood the paint, the painting, of, you know, the couple with the pitchfork and so on, that was uh, what Sarah and Walter Stanley looked like. And they were more or less the caretakers of the farm there. And uh, they took care of the animals, they took care of the crops, and they took care of the flowers and all of that stuff. Uh, the rest of us, if, for my parents, it was a real culture shock because my dad, who had been a judge in Germany and who had never even picked out his own clothing, my mother did that for him, all of a sudden found himself assigned as one of the people who helped in the kitchen, helped uh, every place else, and uh, who, uh, you know, suddenly found himself an equal among other equals. We were all equals. Uh, the parents had a, a very full program of uh, becoming Americanized. I think that was the main purpose originally of uh, Scattergood, was to get uh, immigrant families away from the uh, immigrant ghettos of the big cities and bring them out into the Midwest and integrate them and Americanize them. And uh, there was a wonderful staff there. We kept up with them for, for many years afterwards. Uh, you know, we formed a network of friends. They were not just simply teachers. Uh, Bob Corey uh, taught history, and uh, we learned English, and we learned uh, American cooking and so on with Peggy Hannum and Joyce uh, Ball, uh, Joyce DeLine, who later married and lived in Syracuse. I kept in touch with her till she died, uh, who then became Joyce Ball. Uh, and of course, the, the person who, uh, after we had been there a while and we were considered to be sufficiently Americanized and knew enough English and I knew enough American history and had our first paper started and so forth, uh, the uh, the family, I guess it turned out to stay a family friend, Par Danforth, whom Michael mentioned. I have his picture here. This is Par Danforth. I don't know if you can see him. Higher, 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 higher. higher. Yeah, that's Par. He kept up with us and he would pop up occasionally uh, to see how we were doing. He's the one who once after uh, 10 months or so, of education and life and uh, what a really wonderful country existence in uh, in Iowa, uh, he, who brought us, who found us sponsors in St. Paul, Minnesota, who found us a place to live and found my father a place to work. Of course, it wasn't law because uh, law is not transferable from one country to another. So my dad had to start over. And he started out working in a factory then at the University of Minnesota in the ASTP program, Armed Services Training Program, teaching American soldiers uh, German for the German occupation troops. Unfortunately, uh, as is true of bureaucracies, a lot of them ended up in the uh, occupying forces in Japan, but that's another story. So uh, while we were in uh, Scattergood, uh, my brother and I and the other kids there, we had a kind of wonderful free life there. Uh, we, uh, in one of my uh, 
most poignant memories was when we were uh, running around in the field where the uh, uh, Walter and Sarah Stanley had already mowed down the corn and so on and only part of the stalks were left. I picked up a little field mouse and had it in my hand and the darn thing turned around and bit me and I let go of it. So that was my encounter with the wildlife there. Uh, we yes. had to, so I think this might be a good time to start asking all three of you some of these questions. And the first question that must be asked is, how come this story is not widely known? People do know, people who've done a work in Holocaust uh, history do know about the Oswego Center in upstate New York, where the U.S. government officially took something a little under a thousand refugees. But this Quaker effort in the United States is not broadly known. And I'm wondering who would like to answer that? What would be the reason why it's not better known? Well, uh, one of the things that I feel, and I'm sure Michael can also go into this, is that the Quakers were not into uh, self-promotion very much. And one of the things is that it was the Quaker way to be quiet, to go in and work in the background and do things silently and kind of lead by example. And they were never very much uh, on self-promotion. So uh, these things were done quietly. And there are, I have lots of stories in the archives of really tremendous things that were done by the Quakers that nobody even knows about, unfortunately. I, can, I, I would put on a it is. Yeah, I can attest to that. I mean, we are here because so many people along the way helped us. Our neighbors in Paris, the Cezines, warned us when it was time to leave, so that saved our lives. Or the Swiss family that gave us their life savings and that helped support us in France when we had nothing, when we couldn't find work and so forth. Uh, and when I, I later visited them, uh, they did not want, I asked if I couldn't put their names in as uh, Righteous Gentiles and a number of other organizations that were giving credit to a lot of these people who would help Jews. And they said, no, they, that's what they did. That was uh, what you're supposed to do. We were brought up to believe, I guess, that goes along with uh, the, the belief that uh, virtue is its own reward and you don't always have to be constantly uh, patted on the head and praised and your name bandied about. So a great many people helped a lot of other people uh, all through the war. And I think the story is not known because you have people who just simply do that. The little, the little village in France that saved all those Jews I think it was a Chambon or whatever the name was, uh, when they were asked, why did you do that? Uh, it, they couldn't really even understand the question. Of course, you do that. You do the things that are good, and, and that's you know part of your life mission, and everybody has that duty, and it's nothing that necessarily you want to be constantly talking about. I am sitting on a whole treasure trove of all kinds of letters and information and so on. And I think I'll probably try to give it to the Holocaust studies at Clark University. I know that my father uh, did an oral history for Brandeis University. So there's all kinds of organizations gathering this information, but it's not anything that you, uh, you know, is continuously in the public's eye. Although maybe it should be, maybe it should be part of the school uh, you know, the school curriculum, that some of that, particularly some of those things that happened in World War II. Uh, is, yes, these are exactly the types of stories that should be widely known. Yeah. Uh, and there's a question in the chat box about the U.S. government and whether the Quakers worked at all hand in glove with the U.S. government or was this a totally separate uh, activity? Michael, perhaps? I actually would like to respond to the previous question because I think there's something that two, other two speakers have missed. Um, I was in Switzerland in June and went to the National Museum in, in Zurich. And the Swiss only let Jews come over the border from Germany or Austria only after April of 45. So as the war was almost over, then the Swiss government said, look, we let Jews in. Yeah, the war was almost over. But about Camp Oswego, the problem is Camp Oswego rescue with Ruth Gordon came very late in the war. Plus what I had said that the Quaker response at Scattergood Hostel was the largest direct response. 
I wouldn't say that a government program, you know, one ship taking 1,100 people from collapsing Yugoslavia um, is really direct action. So that's what I meant was um, this was the largest direct action. But the other question about why is the story told, all I can say at this point in a quick um, way is that the Holocaust Museum has been to Iowa several times. They've been to Minnesota, to our former museum. They know about it. But as far as I know, maybe Don has a different experience. But as I looked at their uh, uh, recent exhibit online, I didn't see any big panels about the refugee program at Scattergood Hostel. There are reasons it would be better if you folks ask them. You should call them and ask them, why don't you include Scattergood Hostel in your story about American response to the Holocaust? That would be interesting. Edith, there's a question for you, which is where did your where did your family finally settle down, and what was your profession? Oh, uh, well, my family we were taken to Minnesota, and uh, I went to uh, high school and, and uh, to college. I went to McAllister College, McAllister College in St. Paul, and uh, I. I uh, had really planned to go on, but then I got married while I was in uh, my senior year in college and uh, had to get to work. And so I became a teacher and then I became a school administrator and then I ran for school committee here in Worcester. So I became a politician. And now at 90 years old, I'm retired and I'm still politically active and I do some tutoring and so forth. But uh, so I think both my father who became a professor at McAllister College till he retired and I went into the teaching profession. Now, I would like to turn the floor back to our speakers for some final thoughts, starting with Don Davis. Uh, again, I would like to thank everyone for coming today and being part of the presentation and for the wonderful questions. Um, me personally, if there's anything that you have as far as questions go, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is Don Davis, just the way you see my name there, at afsc.org. And uh, I think that the story of Scouter Good is relevant today more than ever. And it's my job to try and get these stories out there. And I'm happy to help anyone who would be interested in learning more about that. So again, thank you all very much. Edith, what about you? Well, uh, I have a whole lot more information. You can reach me at my email address, lore1930 at yahoo.com or uh, I have a landline telephone, 508-791-0226. So I will eventually answer either of those. I'm putting together all of the stuff on the last of my family left, and I have a whole lot of letters, pictures, and so on. I'm putting together what will be a kind of family history, and that, of course, includes scatter goods. So thank you all for listening, and uh, thanks to all of the pe people who helped us along the way continuously, and I've tried to pay some of that back. Michael, what would you like to say to our audience? I would like to say that I actually wrote this by accident. It wasn't my goal to write this dissertation or the book. I had to do it to stay in Germany, have permission in my passport, but it took over my life. I had the great thrill of meeting 40 of these people, and now, unfortunately, almost all of them are gone, and I do feel it's my obligation to keep telling the story. Many of you have asked, why don't we know the story? It's a pity people have to know it. And so I turn it off over to all of you. It will be told if you tell it. I can't do it by myself. And again, not to be a broken record, the thing you can do the most is you should all contact the US Holocaust Museum, ask them, why have they airbrushed this out of the narrative? It is a story of, of inspiration. It's a story of courage and of blind faith and goodness. It is. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our three illustrious speakers and have a nice rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. 
or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.